Just a few miles off the coast of the island of Newfoundland is a little piece of Europe located almost 4,000 kilometers away from the continent. These are the French-owned islands of Saint-Pierre and Miquelon, the last vestiges of French-owned territory in northern North America. In this video, we'll take a look at why France still owns these tiny islands and why Canada has never officially annexed them. Oh, and if you enjoy this kind of geography content, please be sure to subscribe. It's free and you can always change your mind. Now, France's claim to these islands goes back a long way all the way back to when French explorer Jacques Cartier first claimed the islands, as well as Newfoundland, as a French possession on behalf of the King of France in 1536. While the islands were frequented by local First Nations, as well as a variety of seasonal fishermen from Europe, they were not permanently settled at that time. And it wasn't until the end of the 17th century, when the intendant of New France, Jean Talon, officially named them saint pierre and in 1640. And more French settlers moved to these islands shortly after. Now, economically, these islands are not worth much. They're pretty barren and cold, much like the rest of Newfoundland. And at 242 kilometers squared in area, they're not all that big and important either. Where the interest lies primarily is in the area's fishing. These islands are located near an area known as the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, which used to be one of the largest and most productive fisheries on Earth. Thanks to favorable currents, it was easy and profitable to make a pretty good living off the fishery, and is a key reason why the islands in Newfoundland were so sought after by European powers. The British never really liked the idea of the French having dominance of the Gulf of the St. Lawrence and northern Atlantic seaboard, and in general, one of their major objectives in the early wars in North America was to get France out of the Maritimes entirely. During King William and Queen Anne's wars, English forces launched at least five attacks against French colonial sediments on the islands, and these raids were pretty devastating leading to most of the early French colonists to abandon the islands entirely. Later, in the 1713 treaty that ended the War of the Spanish Succession, France officially ceded the islands to Britain, along with renouncing their claims to the Hudson Bay and Newfoundland. Yet while the islands were given up for a short time, the French were able to keep fishing around Newfoundland, particularly on the northern coast, which was popular with French fishermen. To convince the French to give up their claims to Newfoundland, they were guaranteed access to a significant chunk of the French coast to fish, and the area became known as the French Shore. How the French shore worked in practice is a bit complicated and changed over the decades of its existence, but essentially it discouraged settlement from English fishermen and allowed France to have a significant fishery around Newfoundland and spots where they could dry their fish out. Interestingly, the linguistic impact of the French shore can still be seen today, as parts of Newfoundland, which were major centers of French fishing activity, still have some of the highest percentages of Francophone speakers in the province. Many locations still bear French names due to this history. Of course, given their constant rivalry, eventually the French would butt heads with the English again, and the brutal Seven Years' War would end up radically redrawing the map of North America. Under the terms of the Treaty of Paris in 1763, which put an end to the Seven Years' War, France ceded nearly all of its North American possessions east of the Mississippi to the British, leaving tens of thousands of French-speaking Canadians to deal with the British on their own. But while the French lost the majority of their territory in North America, they would be given back Saint-Pierre Miquelon, in addition to keeping their fishing rights on the French shore as compensation for the British taking all of Quebec and Acadia. Many in the French government of the time viewed Canada as an unprofitable colony, which some French diplomats famously referred to as a few acres of snow. Canada was also expensive to upkeep as there was constant wars over it, either with the British or the local First Nations, and it pretty much just produced fur, which wasn't exactly the most profitable export on the market. So in addition to keeping their profitable fishing and gaining St. Pierre and Miquelon, the French were also able to keep a few of their profitable sugar-growing Caribbean colonies like Guadalupe, which the British had captured during the war. With St. Pierre and Miquelon firmly in French hands, over the next decade and a half, they became a place of refuge for many Acadians, and some even tried to farm on the islands, though these efforts were not super successful, and the majority had to rely on fishing and fish drying from visiting French fleets to survive. There still is a little bit of farming on the islands these days, but not a lot. And the islands lived in peace and harmony forever after, oh wait, there's another war. With France allied with the United States during the American Revolution, Britain took the opportunity to invade and raise the colony in 1778, sending nearly the entire French-speaking population of some 2,000 people over to France. This would start a long trend of the British taking it, and then the French taking it, and each pushing settlers off the islands. After the American Revolution ended in British defeat, the islands were returned back to France. Although the French shore was 
was reduced in size a little bit and moved to accommodate Newfoundland's demands, though France was granted exclusive rights to their chunk of the coast, meaning no one else could fish in their zone, essentially creating a protected foreign fishery inside British waters that were under their own laws and customs and supervised by both nations. The French control of saint pierre Miquelon didn't last long though, as shortly after the American Revolution ended, the French Revolutionary Wars began, and the British took the islands once more in 1793, after just a decade of French rule, and tried to populate them with British settlers. Yet this British settlement didn't do quite that well, as the French sacked it just three years later. The islands would then bounce back and forth quite a few times during the Napoleonic Wars, and the French finally got them back for good after Napoleon's final exile to St. Helena in 1815. France then reclaimed the now uninhabited islands where all structures and buildings had been destroyed or had fallen into disrepair following decades of war, and began rebuilding. The islands were finally resettled in 1816 by mostly Bosque and Breton fishermen from the French west coast, and for the next 80 years, increased fishing on the Grand Banks and the Gulf of the St. Lawrence brought a bit of prosperity to the little colony, and the population rose considerably to almost 7,000 people by 1902. This prosperity didn't last long though, as France was looking to improve their relations with the British at the turn of the century to counteract rising power from Central Europe. As part of the Entente Cordiale Agreement in 1904, France gave up most of its rights to the French shore after over a century of fishing there. And in return, Britain agreed to pay financial compensation to French outfitters with premises on it, also ceded a bit of West Africa to them. The French were allowed to keep fishing in this region seasonally though, but they couldn't exclusively use the shore. And this convention remained in force until 1972, when Canada struck a deal with France. This change resulted in fewer fishing vessels needing to stop at St. Pierre for supply, and many of the larger steamships could return to France with their catch without needing to stop at the shore or at St. Pierre either. This led to an economic downturn that led to a significant number of the people on the islands immigrating to Quebec and Canada, and this combined with the draft imposed on all male inhabitants of conscript age on the island had a profound impact on the population. About 400 people from the colony served in the French military during World War I, about 25% of whom died, which exacerbated the depopulation problem, with the colony's population declining by half in just a couple decades. They did find a bit of prosperity as a smuggling point for booze into America during Prohibition, but that didn't last very long, and the islands kept on pushing through the remainder of their 30s just fishing away, and then another world war came. The Second World War was a pretty contentious time for the islands, as the governor of St. Pierre Miquelon swore allegiance to the German allied Vinci French government, and it was at this time that the Newfoundland and Canadian governments were starting to consider to invade the islands themselves, and some within Newfoundland even considered annexing them outright. The Canadian government was particularly concerned that the Axis might use the islands as a base of operations and could offer German ships a good position to pre-supply and coordinate attack upon Allied convoys during the Battle of the Atlantic. Canada and Newfoundland never went through with the invasion of the islands though, for fear of offending the United States and pushing the French citizens and Vinci government closer to the Germans. The United States also vigorously opposed any forceful attempt to take control of the islands as they saw it as an affront to the Monroe Doctrine. The invasion never happened though, since Charles de Gaulle, the leader of the Free French Movement, ordered the capture of Saint Pierre and Miquelon against the orders of the Canadian Navy. On December 23, 1941, under the pretext of a training mission, a French flotilla consisting of a submarine and three corvettes sailed from Halifax and captured the islands in only 20 minutes. And this would mark the last time the islands would be invaded, but not the end of territorial disputes with them. St. Pierre would fade in a lot of people's minds until the 1970s, when Canada tried to reduce cod fishing around Newfoundland out of fear of seriously declining fish stocks. The Grand Banks, after over a century of fishing and over fishing thanks to trawlers had resulted in a near depletion of the fishery. While France's control of the islands was basically settled at this point, the exclusive economic zone for fishing and offshore oil extraction was not, and as such many French fishermen from the islands still fished in areas Canada claimed and tried to limit fishing in. The Canadian government responded to this by inspecting French fishing trawlers and even jailed some fishermen, causing something of a diplomatic dispute. In total, France claimed a 200 mile exclusive economic zone for saint pierre Miquelon and enforced this by sending naval assets to the area to explore for oil in the disputed zone. But instead of fighting it out, like they had in the past, in 1992, an arbitration panel awarded the islands an exclusive economic zone of 12,348 square kilometers. However, this represented only about 25% of what France had originally sought. The resulting French economic zone has an unusual shape. It's kind of like a keyhole, with a 20 kilometer wide and 348 kilometer long narrow corridor that runs south of the islands to international waters. 
and due to this shape, it's been more difficult for the islands to live off the fishery. Overall, the cod fishery collapse has impacted both Newfoundland and St. Pierre Miquelon massively, and both jurisdictions have had to find ways to diversify their economy. Newfoundland was able to get into the offshore oil business and utilized its significant hydro and iron resources in Labrador to fill some of the economic gap, while St. Pierre Miquelon has aimed at tourism, leaning heavily into its status as a piece of France, with all the festivities that go along with that, but they are still pretty financially dependent on mainland France to survive. Most of the tourists that visit the islands are from Canada, and this has resulted in the Canadian dollar being widely used, but change usually given in euros. And unlike America or any state on earth, if you're a Canadian citizen and you're coming directly from Canada for a stay of less than three months, a passport is not required, making it the only nation on earth you can visit passport free aside from the international parks on the US border, if you're Canadian. There has been some oil exploration in the French EEZ, but so far nothing major has come up yet. But if they do find some oil, well, let's just say who knows what the future a hole for them. There's always nations that are interested in countries with oil. What do you think of these islands? Should Canada have invaded them during the COD conflict? Let me know in the comments below. And thanks for watching.